Okay, I got tagged three times last week, so I'm going to do three tags on Tuesday. So this will be the Try Tag Tuesday. The three tags are the Anthropod tag created by Jack over at the Rambling Rockin' Tour. Thank you, Jack, for tagging me. Really interesting tag. Hang to deal with bugs. Bugs not my favorite thing, but, you know, it'll be kind of fun. Uh, I was also tagged by Josh over at Literary, Literary Gladiator to do Josh's bread tag. Uh, Josh does, like, foodie tags where he comes up with, like, a food category and he comes up with book prompts. Uh, uh, so thank you, Josh, uh, for tagging me. And then Steve Donahue tagged me to do Elaine Howland's book addict tag uh, this week as well. So I, you know, thought... If I keep going like this and don't uh, catch up uh, and I get tagged or find tags I want to do more, I'm going to be way behind on my tags. So I just thought I would do them all three today. I realize for many of you that means, or for some of you, you may think, well, I'm not going to really be paying enough attention. Sorry, uh, I did. I promise I thought about all these and I have uh, considered my answers. I will leave tags to the three different, uh, I'll leave a timestamp. Icush. I'll leave a timestamp of three different tags down in the description box below. People seem to like that when I did it with the uh, Q&A uh, video that I did on Saturday. So here we go. The first one is the Anthropod book tag, and I'm going to have to use my phone to read these. So prompt number one, some insects are critical to our global ecosystem because they transfer pollen between flowering plants, stimulating biodiversity and the reproduction of these species. What is a book that has pollinated your reading life and helped you restart reading? Uh, right before I started my booktube channel, I'd, I'd gotten back into reading uh, a lot more seriously. Uh, there was a time when my kids were really busy uh, and I was driving all over the place and uh, and working and other stuff that I, I really kind of really slowed down in my reading. But three books probably got me back into that that I started that I read, you know, just before I started my booktube channel. The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich, Underground Railroad uh, by Colson Whitehead, and Moonglow by uh, Michael Shabon. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, Moonglow wasn't really very good, uh, but still, uh, it kind of, because it wasn't all that good, it kind of help me uh, regain some of my critical faculties for reading. Okay, prompt number two is just to name an insect Do you find particularly interesting. I'm gonna say ants. I was one of those kids who like, you know, watched ants, kicked over ant hills to watch the ants scramble around. Uh, so I'm gonna go with ants, even though I have to be honest with you, bugs not high on my list of things I find interesting. Uh, prompt number three, many arachnids create webs to trap their prey. What is a work that really stuck to you and drew you into its world? Um, so for that, I decided to go with something I've read relatively recently, and that was uh, the first volume of N.K. Jemison's Broken uh, Earth series called The Fifth Season. Uh, and I, I chose that one because I thought she did a really great job of just throwing you into the world she created and then kind of allowing you to learn about that wor world through the actions of her character. <laughs> So the regular, you know, Zelda and Ike bark and ruin the video thing just happened. I don't know how much of Prompt 3's answer was lost. I can't remember. So let me just say, N.K. Jemison's the fifth season, the first volume in her Broken Earth trilogy. That uh, was create a world that really uh, I got stuck in. Prompt number four says, Mirapod, the Mirapod millipede derives its name from the belief that it has a thousand legs, when in reality, most species have fewer than 700. What is a work that had a high page count, but you felt was much shorter when you read it? I'm not honestly gonna tell you Anna Karenina was that book. I know I've seen people recently complain about the farming sections in Anna Karenina uh, who've read it, and I, I really like the book. And even though it's really long, I can't remember how long it is, even though it's really pretty long, um, it didn't read long for me, which is unusual. Uh, Russian literature and I oftentimes don't get along, but that one I really liked. Prompt number five, the scorpion is an infamous arachnid with a venomous stinger in its t on its tail. What is a work that stung you with its ending? I'm gonna go with The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Um, I've read two Colson Whitehead novels. They're pretty different. I liked both of them uh, immensely. And when I get time, I'm gonna go read some of his uh, catalogs, some of his back title catalogs. I really liked it. And if you haven't read The Nickel Boys, you should, except for the Book two prize uh, this year uh, in the fiction category, and I really thought it was good, and it has uh, an interesting ending. Uh, prompt number six: uh, Crustaceans are a diverse subphylum of 
arthropods. It's arthropods, not anthropods. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack. I've been saying anthropod. It's arthropods. Wow. Uh, crustaceans are a diverse uh, subphylum of arthropods that live in water. Name a work that makes you think of the sea. Um, and that's a book I've mentioned many times here on, on BookTube. That's Gould's Book of Fish, um, which was an Australian novel. I think it might have been nominated for the Man Booker, won the Man Booker. Anyway, uh, it essentially involves a man in a prison colony in Tasmania, and he is placed in a cell that floods uh, twice a day. Uh, and he keeps a journal of what's going on in this prison uh, colony, and he uses the fish that he catches and kills to make ink from. They're cool little pictures of uh, fish and sea life. Anyway, that's the book that makes me think of the sea. Prompt seven, the trilobites flourished in the oceans before going extinct in the Permian mass extinction. Who is a writer that will not produce any more work that you believe was influential but is now sadly uh, neglected? Um, so this is one of those things that, uh, that uh, Steve Donahue and I have in common. I'm going to say John Dos Passos. Uh, Dos Passos' USA Trilogy uh, and Manhattan Transfer are really innovative works that blend uh, newspaper um, headlines and, uh, and newspaper stories with you know, just kind of what were called, he called camera eye segments, which were just kind of looks at American society interwoven in the text and around the story of his characters. And I really think that was incredibly uh, innovative and important. If you read uh, George Saunders' Lincoln, uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, uh, and you notice there were all those kind of newspaper articles and things that kind of put give you context about where we were in terms of the Civil War and Lincoln's presidency, Dos Passos definitely influenced that. And, not, you know, almost nobody... Uh, reads uh, John Dos Passos anymore, which by the way, maybe in July, I will give another look at the USA Trilogy. Seems appropriate. Uh, let's see, prompt number eight. Uh, is there an arthropod that you're afraid of or concerned about? Uh, brown recluse spiders uh, are one of the two poisonous spiders uh, in my area. They're small. I know several people have been bit and uh, uh, went through some excruciating pain, including one who had to have surgery to remove the area where the uh, spider uh, bit her. And so that sounds pretty bad to me. So th that would be what I said for the, for the uh, arthropod I'm afraid of. Let's see, prompt number nine, ending on a high note. Some arthropods, uh, like the butterfly, undergo an extraordinary metamorphosis. The fully grown butterfly soars over the ground that the caterpillar, caterpillar scuttles across. What is a work that opens your mind and help it take flight? And I'm going to say Beloved by Toni Morrison. Uh, that was the first T Toni Morrison I read. You know that I'm a big fan of Southern literature and uh, a Faulknerite. Uh, and I had heard one of my friends who'd read Beloved said, there's nothing in it that you won't find in Faulkner. And that's just not true. Uh, Beloved was uh, an eye-opening experience for me in terms of helping me find my way to Toni Morrison and her work uh, and helping me to uh, realize that there was something beyond uh, the great men of American literature who emerged in the 1920s and 30s. So I'm going to tag three people to do this this tag because they seem like kind of uh, outdoorsy or buggy people, or I just owe them a tag. So Doris from All the Books, I'm tagging you. Uh, Lori from Winsong Reads, it was glad to see you uh, and are posting videos again. I know it hasn't been that long, but I wanted to. I'd like to see your answers because we were kind of. Uh, in, the, in the comment section talking, talking about uh, the area where you live in New Hampshire and the natural beauty there. And then Leo from A Little Book Life uh, who tagged me to do the world book tag. I want to tag him. There you go. That's the arthropod, not anthropod. That's the arthropod book tag. Again, thanks uh, to Jack from Rambling Rock and Tour. And the, uh, uh, the, I'll leave a link to his channel in the show notes below. Okay, so this is the second tag on my Try Tag Tuesday. Uh, this is the this is Josh's bread tag. Uh, Josh from Luduri Gladiators does a series of foodie tags. This one is about bread. He had one about donuts that I did, which I really like because I like donuts. Anything that's about bread is going to get me. Again, I have to read the prompts off my phone. Uh, sorry for that. And also, again, uh, I didn't pull the books off my shelf because 
with all three tags, it would be way too many books. So prompt one, white, a work of 21st century genre fiction you can see being studied in the years to come. So I'm going to say N.K. Jemison's The City We Became. So N.K. Jemison, uh, who I mention oftentimes, in part because I haven't read a lot of fantasy recently, uh, N.K. Jemison is a really innovative, uh, critically acclaimed writer of fantasy, uh, you know, uh, who's still riding good day. And while I haven't read The City We Became, I read a short story from which the city we became grew, and that story was really amazing and innovative. And by the way, I want to thank I want to thank Dini uh, for bringing that story uh, to my attention. And the city we became in the series she started is something I'm seriously thinking about uh, trying to get to uh, read that first book this summer. So that would be my answer to prompt one. Prompt two: uh, Whole wheat, a work you are reluctant to read but feel you need to read at some point. I'm going to go with Normal People by Sally Rooney. I have avoided. Uh, reading Sally Rooney because there's either so much positive or negative hype. I just I just wasn't interested, but at some point I think I have to at least read one of her books so I can make a decision about you know whether to read more and what I think about her. Uh, is she overrated? Is she innovative? That would be my answer prompt two. Prompt number three, a writer that can write in any genre or category. Uh, I went with Italo Calvino. Uh, he wrote uh, short stories. He wrote novels. Some of his novels are kind of like historical fiction. Some of his novels are futurist. Some of his novels uh, kind of are almost uh, like detective stories. Um, I believe he wrote flash fiction, and I think he even wrote some essays. Uh, so I would go with Italo Calvino, and it seemed perfect because he's an Italian writer, and the prompt was Italian bread. Prompt number four, garlic bread. Which genre or category would you argue has the most versatility and why? Uh, I'm just going to go with general fiction. I think this was Josh's answer as well. Sometimes people call this literary fiction. I don't like that term either, and lots of people don't. So I'm just going to start saying general fiction. By that, I mean novels that are not in a genre. And so that, to me, is the most versatile because it can actually pull in all kinds of things from other genres without necessarily having to follow the, uh, the standard process of, of that genre. Prompt number five is Pumpernickel, a work that was hard to digest. I'm going to go with Malloy by Samuel Beckett. Not only was it complicated and confusing, uh, and did it require, you know, a lot of thinking, but it was also pretty depressing. Uh, so that made that pretty hard to digest. Uh, let's see. Prompt number six is Rye, an overbearing perspective in a given work. I'm going to go with uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, that book is so caught up with uh, giving us an idea of Hemingway's uh, beliefs about courage uh, and his love for Spain, that, that there's not a lot of um, question about where he wants you to come down and what he wants you to believe uh, about the characters there. And, you know, Hemingway kind of overbearing as well. I have to tell you, even having said that, novel-wise, I think For Whom the Bell Tolls is probably Hemingway's best novel, but I've always said Hemingway's a much better short story writer anyway. Prompt number seven is Sourdough, a writer whose works are usually cynical. I went with J.M. Uh, Kutsia, the uh, South African writer who I believe is uh, relocated to um, Australia. Um, I've read three or four of his books, and I think cynicism pretty well describes uh, how uh, or his approach or what comes through in his novels. Not that I don't think that they're, they're not sometimes good. I definitely do. Uh, let's see. Prompt number eight, Banana, a character that made something out of a given situation. Uh, you, if you've been following my channel recently, you know that I uh, just recently read uh, Leonard and Hungry Paul, and I just found it delightful. I know, I think I'm in the minority of opinion about that, uh, and I will tell you, it's, there, you know, it was what I would call kind of nothing fancy, but I, I just found it delightful, and I thought Hungry Paul <laughs> kind of... Uh, made an extraordinary leap by just taking advantage of situations as they presented themselves. He didn't necessarily seek things out so much as just be himself, and, and it just kind of worked out. Uh, number nine, Chala, a work that helped you develop a better understanding of Judaism. I have to admit here, Josh, you kind of got me. I couldn't think of a work of fiction that did that, and I will tell you that uh, studying Judaism is not something 
uh, I've done a lot of uh, beyond just, you know, basics of world religion. I did read uh, parts of uh, a book that contains selections from, from the Kabbalah. So uh, the Kabbalah, uh, or Kabbalists, I believe, are kind of a mystic organization within, or mystic belief system within Judaism. Uh, and so that's, that's really the best I could do. Uh, number 10 is Matzo, a book that reminds you about the importance of modest, modesty. Uh, I'm going to go with Persuasion um, by Jane Austen, and Elliot is my favorite Austen heroine, and I think modesty is her primary, um, one of her primary character traits on top of being incredibly capable and being incredibly smart and being incredibly kind. Uh, she's just my favorite, um, and that book reminds you, I think, of the virtue of, of living that kind of life. Um, prompt 10, Daily, as in Daily Bread, a book that should be in every standard family household library. So I picked three. Oh, I picked three, To Kill a Mockingbird, Pride and Prejudice, and Huckleberry Finn. Those are, the, those are the three I picked. Uh, that's a pretty American-centric, other than Pride and Prejudice. That's a fairly American, Anglo-centric list. But, you know, I'm an American, and I can't help but think about my family library being uh, literally uh, my family library. Prompt number 12 is Baguette. Name three books that are perfect to dip in and out of. I love nothing more than dipping in and out of short story books, so I chose three short story collections. That would be uh, the collected stories of Eudora Welty, uh, the collected stories of Flannery O'Connor, and then a book of nonfiction writing from The New Yorker um, by a writer named Joseph Mitchell, who's most famous for uh, Joe Gould's Secret uh, and probably McSorley's Bar. These were essays he wrote from The New Yorker. They're, they're long, but they're a great, I think, example of of prose style, of a um, nonfiction writing style that is incredibly engaging. Uh, they're collecting a book called Up in the Old Hotel, and that is a book I, I love to dip in and out of. Uh, let's see, whoops, close my thing. Prompt number 13, Olive Garden Breadstick, an unexpectedly great book you read this year. Um, well, I would go with The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Uh, nothing about Toni Morrison's books being great should necessarily uh, surprise me. But this was her first novel, and I could not believe how in control and how powerful the writing of that book was and how tightly told that story was. And so that was a book that surprised me by how great it was. I expected it to be good. I expected to like and appreciate it. I did not expect it to be as great as it was. And it is, it is a great book. Uh, problem number 14 is your favorite kind of uh, bread. So my favorite kind of bread is a cranberry walnut uh, bagel. Uh, I love bagels, and my favorite is cranberry walnut, so that's my favorite kind of bread. And then prompt 15 is bread truck. Who do you tag? I'm going to tag uh, three people. Uh, Mel from Mel's Bookland Adventure. Uh, I don't know that Mel still does tags, but I do know that Mel writes all the time or, or on her videos and, and on Twitter, sometimes talks about how much she loves bread and how much she misses all the bread different kinds of bread in Germany. Uh, Madeline from Made With Books, uh, and then Celia uh, from That's Her Channel uh, in Norway. Uh, I think I tagged them because I think they'll have from some pretty in interesting types of bread. And uh, I noticed that, uh, uh, what is it, Lefse bread, I believe, was left off this list, which I think Celia is a, uh, a Norwegian style of bread. There you go. That's Josh's uh, bread tag. Uh, I'll leave a link to Josh's channel down below and probably the prompts for those people who I tagged. So the third tag on this uh, Try Tag uh, Tuesday is the uh, Book Addict tag. Uh, Steve Donahue was nice enough to tag me to do this. This tag was created uh, by Elaine over to Lane Howland. I'll leave links to both their channels and this tag uh, in the show notes down below. Um, so this is just general uh, questions about you know being a book nerd like I am. Uh, so question number one, what's the longest amount of time you can go without picking up a book? I'm going to say a day. There are still days where sometimes I don't read a book at all, but I will say uh, I do pick up a book uh, almost every day um, and, and read something. I'm kind of a binge reader. I either read, uh, you know, uh, 
50 to 80 pages from a book or I read 10. Uh, I am a slow reader. Uh, so I go on long benches and there are some days when other things just intrude or, uh, you know, I'm doing other stuff and I just can't read and, and I don't, I can't actually get to the book or I choose not to get to the book. Prompt two, how many books do you carry on your person at a time? Well, the only way I carry books is in audiobooks or uh, ebooks that I have on my phone uh, and I'm cheap, so almost all of those are free. I have uh, ebooks of, um, of two uh, Dickens novels. Um, oh. <laughs> now the names, wow, the names, David Copperfield uh, is one, Bleak House is the other. Uh, I have uh, an ebook of um, The Charter House of Parma by Stendhal, and I have excuse me, an audio book of The Charter House of Palm by Stendhal, and an audio book of one of the Sherlock Holmes uh, series of stories uh, on my phone. I also have a couple of free ebooks. These are primarily short novels by uh, Surprise Surprise on a Rate of Balzac that I can just read if I have to sit in a line somewhere and I didn't bring a physical book. Uh, prompt number three, do you keep every book you buy or read? I'm going to say yes for the most part. Uh, I'm pretty careful uh, about what I buy. I know my taste pretty well. Uh, and even if I buy a book by a new author and I don't like it uh, particularly uh, a, a great deal, I, I usually keep that book anyway uh, because I like having that book around for a chance to reread it in case I change my mind or in case I see something from somebody that maybe I didn't think about. I will say the book two prize is probably at my, the book two prize and my uh, plans this year to read uh, more genre fiction may have uh, maybe the exception. There are definitely some books, <coughs> three women. Uh, that will be uh, going back to use bookstores or I will be donating to Goodwill. Problem number four, how, would you, how long would you spend uh, in a bookshop on a standard visit? Uh, 30 minutes to an hour. Again, I usually know what I'm looking for uh, when I go. Uh, I don't do a lot of just going to the bookstore and walking around and browsing. That, that can be fun, but uh, to be honest with you, the, the bookstores where I would want to do that are you know a good hour away from my house uh, I'd have to drive into Houston which I do sometimes uh, and so browsing around those bookstores I might stay longer but then you're already talking about you know that's an hour to get there an hour in the store an hour in the next store an hour to get home that's four hours and to be honest with you uh, for the most part there, there are very few days where I have four hours or I spend like or feel like on the weekend spending two hours in the car uh, to do that. Problem number five is how much time a day do you spend reading? That depends on the day. I kind of indicated this uh, sooner. Um, on the weekend, it might be, you know, one to four hours. That's a, usually about uh, all I can do, sometimes longer. Uh, back when I was working, and I still kind of am working because I'm teaching from home now, uh, on work days where I have lots to do, papers to grade, lectures to record, emails to answer, uh, it might be one or two hours. Uh, and again, there are still some days where I don't get to a book at all. There are other things I want to do uh, or there are other things I have to do. Uh, prompt six, where does the task of picking up a book appear on your to-do list? So my to-do list is usually chronological and this is one of the great things about being on the verge of retirement. I get to decide how I want to spend the different parts of my day. Uh, so for right now, this is the order of events that take place uh, in my day. So number one, coffee. Number two, rage tweet. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll apologize. I do that all the time. I'm a rage tweeter. Uh, number three, uh, let's see, I check booktube and watch videos. Number four, I read. Number five, I work. Uh, after retirement, when I'm finally done teaching the semester, that work I hope will be replaced with writing. I'll work on my writing project then. Number six, rage tweet. Number seven, uh, booktube. Number eight, read. Number nine is family time. Um, you know, my wife works. Um, my son is in college and he's living at home. So the time we can spend family time together is usually at night. And then after that's over, uh, then I read before I go to bed. Uh, prompt seven, how many books do you reckon you own? I'm going to say around 900. I did kind of a general count, which came out between... I think eight and nine hundreds, probably more than that. Uh, I have books that are behind the books, which I for, didn't think about counting. So I'm going to say around nine hundred. Uh, prompt eight: How often do you bring up books in conversation? 
And the answer to that is is almost never. Uh, one of the reasons why I started book, my BookTube channel was so I could talk to people about books. There are very few people in my life, other than my wife and my son occasionally, who uh, are willing to engage in a conversation about books. And then I oftentimes find that when I do find people who read and want to talk about books, our reading tastes are so dissimilar that those conversations can be really difficult to have. It's more like, hey, you know, I read this great book and it was like this and, you know, you should read it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, great, thanks. And I think, well, that doesn't really sound like a book I want to read. Well, on, on BookTube, you can have those thoughts. That doesn't really sound like a book I want to read. And you, you don't have to, like, say anything to the person. You don't have, can't see your face, you know, and judge that you really don't like it. And so, you know, it's a lot more comfortable. In part, I started my BookTube channel so I could have uh, those conversations. Uh, prompt number nine, what's the biggest page count book you've read? Uh, again, that would be Proust, the, 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 uh, the collection of Remembrance of Things Past that I have is in three volumes. And volume one contains Swan's Way and Within a Budding Grove. I think it comes out to right around 1,030 pages. I read that not this year, but last year from March of the Mammoths. I'm pretty sure that's the longest book, even though I plan on reading a longer book this year. Uh, that would be The English and Their History is a book I'm hoping to read this summer. Uh, number 10, is there a book you had to get your hands on against all odds? Uh, again, bog standard answer here, uh, Harry Potter books. Uh, I went with my wife and my kids who are huge Harry Potter uh, fans, I think on three separate occasions to... Uh, the Midnight releases, and I guess that counts as a book I had to get my hands on because I was a part of that process. Uh, number 11, a book you struggled to finish uh, but uh, kept going uh, and but were, but were reluctant to DNF. I think I mentioned this before. David Foster Wallace's book, The Broom of the System, uh, much too long. Uh, some interesting ideas, which I think was what Wallace is best at. Uh, but, you know, played out over way too many uh, pages. And it, it was kind of a grind by the end because you could kind of see where things were going. Uh, but that would be my answer there. And then, uh, let's see, three main bookish goals. So the first is uh, is kind of a, a, a booktube goal, and that's to make sure I finish all my booktube pro projects that I read more genre fiction this year. Uh, which I'm trying to continue to do. I've done at least one genre fiction read each month uh, this year. I want to make sure I do that. I want to make sure I keep up with my short story project. By the way, this month's short story is The Jilting of Granny Weatherall by Catherine Ann Porter. Uh, I also want to read that book I mentioned, uh, The English uh, and Their History, which is a big history book of comprehensive, comprehensive, a survey book, not comprehensive, of English history uh, that I saw on Justin, the Ghost Reader's channel, uh, a while back, and I got a copy, and it looks just really great and interesting, kind of an Anglophile. And then um, I want to read more classic works of history. Lukash uh, was just uh, finished reading Suetonius's Twelve Caesars, and that just sounded really good. I did pick it up, uh, and I read the Julius Caesar section. I want to do that. I'm a historian. You know, I should have read Herodotus and Thucydides, and I have read uh, a book by Tacitus and Suetonius, and you know these are people I, I should have read, but somehow, uh, since my history focus was American history, uh, I didn't. Anyway, that those would be my bookish goals, and that I believe yes is the uh, book addict book tag. Thank you, Steve, for tagging me. Thank you, Elaine, for creating this great tag. Look forward to your comments in the comment section below, and as always, thank you for watching.